I've been asked a number of times to explain what I mean by reaction practice. This is a, a language I developed with uh, an Indian uh, uh, public preceptor, Dhammachari Chandra Shil. Uh, we, we developed it because in India, people's lives are very all-enveloping. Uh, they uh, um, live in family settings, almost all of them. There are a few who are unmarried and live at Baja, for instance. You'll see a couple of them tomorrow or tonight. Uh, but most are married. Uh, and um, uh, so married life, domestic life, family life in India is all enveloping in both positive ways and not so positive ways. But you're always obliged, obligated to your family and your family is vast. So you have to go to loads of weddings because if you don't go to loads of weddings, no one will come to your uh, sons and daughters' weddings. Etc. And it's a form. It's a form of social security. So quite literally, if people are in trouble, the, the extended family will even pay for um, medical treatment and so on. So you need to keep that alive, and it occupies a lot of time. Also, India is difficult to travel in, so it always takes a long time to get uh, from uh, uh, where you live to where you work, unless you're very lucky and it's, it's exhausting, etc., uh, etc. Et so what we'd find is people come on retreat, they'd have a really good time, uh, they'd go back and they can't really keep up a regular meditation or only do it very... Um, some people are very disciplined, but often at a little bit of cost, if you see what I mean. Um, often people just can't do it. And uh, so we began to talk, Chandrashil and I, because we were leading uh, retreats together, on how we could get the retreat experience to continue. And I tried all sorts of different things, like getting people to take make resolutions and so on. And of course, the resolution lasts till the railway station. Um, that was my big joke, that the retreat ends at the railway station, which is a, a walk across the fields, for instance. Um, it's just, Indian life is just all enveloping and it's a struggle, a big struggle all the time. So what we, we began to realise is that people needed to use the situations they were in in order to uh, work on themselves. There's a lot of tensions between people, inevitably in such a, a, a pressured and difficult situation, tensions come out between people and it's classic, uh, although these are third generation Buddhists often, second generation Buddhists, they're still legatees of casteism. They still, uh, uh, um, you, you know, residually uh, carry the trauma of, uh, of caste oppression. And uh, Obante says somewhere that uh, what happens when you're at the bottom of the heap is that you attack your own kind because you can't attack upwards. I'm sure it's true with other forms of uh, oppression. So you get a lot of tension amongst people at that level. Uh, where else are they going to take out their aggression and, uh, and so on? Of course, it's changed a lot since conversion, but uh, it's still there. So there's quite a bit of that sort of uh, tension between people. So we felt that people needed to own their own experience and look at their own experience instead of projecting onto other people. So between us, I can't remember who coined the phrase, but maybe neither of us did, and it came out of the two of us, as it were. We came up with this idea of what we call reaction practice. So what reaction practice essentially consists in is valuing your reactions. Uh, not in the sense of going out and being reactive, you don't have to try. A reaction will happen. Uh, it happens all the time because we're in interaction uh, with others and with the world and it doesn't always go the way we want it to. So there's always going to be throughout the day minute and major uh, reactions within us which then get played out in, in our interaction. Um, 
so uh, the, the usual line would be, uh, um, you know, stop reacting, <laughs> uh, if you see what I mean. It would be kind of don't react. But uh, that doesn't take you very far because what do you do? What do you do with the energy that's involved? So we began to look at ways in which people could have a sort of basic, very simple framework for looking at the reaction and valuing it. And uh, I, I thought that some things that we studied in the, in the uh, lecture by Bante were very, very useful. Do you remember that he's talking about Tapa Nagpo as the, uh, as, as the world, uh, the world of, of uh, egoity, of um, separate self? Thank you, it's just come back on. <laughs> uh, the world of separate self, which is writ large uh, and uh, becomes um, uh, aggressive, manipulative, dominating, and so forth, if it can. You know, you could see in some of the modern pol uh, political situations, geopolitical situations around us, very clearly that force operating on, on a massive scale, producing huge suffering. So Bante, if you remember in the talk, says we shouldn't just sort of reject Tarpanagpo, uh, the, 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 the beast itself, the beast which is in us and around us. We should uh, 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 look within that situation for its own solution. So he says, we've got the Turton, that is the taker out of the treasure in the Nyingma tradition. Uh, the person who digs deep into the body of Tarpanagpo, into, digs deep into the whole reactive situation and finds the exact remedy for the concrete situation within the situation itself. So how do we find the exact remedy for the concrete situation within the situation itself? Here talking about the concrete situation of our own reaction. Of course, reactions aren't necessarily, as it were, negative in the sense that they're, uh, you, you know, uh, directed towards um, aggression towards others or uh, accusation or blame or whatever of others. Uh, reactions are also craving. Hatred and, and, and greed are merely opposite sides of the same coin. So uh, uh, the reaction can take the form of becoming fixated, etc., cetera, um, uh, and uh, um, you know, craving something, wanting something, can be ambition, it can be person, it can be goods, all sorts of things, ideas, and then uh, as a result of that craving, uh, becoming uh, ethically careless uh, and uh, you know, harming on the way to it. So the, as it were, uh, pleasant side, Actually, craving is not pleasant, but we don't notice it's not pleasant because we're focused on the, the pleasure that we will get when it's fulfilled. This is a quite important psychological mechanism to notice that your craving is actually a state of dissatisfaction. But you don't think of it as that because you're thinking of when you get whatever it is and the pleasure that you will get from that. But yes, we need to think of both sides of it. But in the nature of things, we're much more likely to notice the, uh, the, the, the uh, as it were, negative, the more on the side of aversion. We're more likely to notice that because it's more painful. Uh, it's more immediately painful. So generally, when I talk about reaction, I'm going to be talking about that. But I want it to be clear that we also have to include the, uh, the, the attractive side of, of reaction. If you can work with that, so much the better. But it's quite a good place to start with the, uh, the reactivity of interaction. Of course, sometimes our attractions, particularly in, in teamwork, can also be a problem uh, because we then become partial. I don't mean necessarily sexual or romantic attraction, but just we like somebody because they're like us or because they're nice to us or something like that, that can then become a problem. But you often don't notice that so easily. What you do notice is that somebody is annoying you uh, because they're inherently annoying. Uh, that's what one feels 
Um, so what we were trying to uh, suggest uh, was that uh, one, it, one's first approach is that this is not a disaster. This is not something going wrong. It's a clue to where energy lies. It's a clue to where those demons are that we need to transform. Because, you know, we all loved hearing Bante say, uh, let the demons come. It's a wonderful thing to say. But what the earth do you do? Um, I said, well, I nearly said, what the hell do you do? And of course, that's the apposite uh, term, isn't it? What the hell do you do uh, to um, take these demons on? Well, I would say, let's start with the demons inside us. And don't forget what Bante's saying is that the demons are not bad, they're energy. They're energy that if we can uh, uh, stop it from having a, an unskillful expression, we can draw upon in order to feed our spiritual lives. So the, the process is pretty simple. Uh, first of all, you notice yourself going into reaction. And you notice it usually because it, you, it hurts a bit. There's a bit of, of a feeling of uh, a, an unpleasant feeling, uh, a, 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 you know, unpleasant affect. So you, you notice that. And personally, I think this is a general issue with spiritual life. I think it's very, very important to notice dukkha, not as something simply to be removed, but as a clue to something's wrong. I mean, it can be simply a clue to the fact that your hand is in the fire. If without pain, you wouldn't notice. You, I re reading recently about people who, I can't remember the word for it, but they're born without um, pain sensation. And uh, life is a, a very dangerous business for them because they don't know that, that their hand is uh, on a hot pan or something like that. So uh, uh, even in the ordinary sense, dukkha is very important to us. Of course, it gets out of, out of control and it can become kind of endemic when there's nerve damage and so on. But uh, in the first place, quite straightforward, it, it's a clue. Actually, it's a clue in a deeper way, you know, there's the three levels of dukkha. There's uh, dukkha dukkha, the actual suffering. Then there's the parinama dukkha, which is the dukkha that is the consequence of change. Because you crave things and cling to them, you're going to suffer. So that's a clue, isn't it? That craving doesn't work, clinging doesn't work. It's actually telling us something valuable. Then, of course, the deepest dukkha, uh, the, the uh, um, uh, sanskara dukkha, Sankara Dukkha tells us that just uh, 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 identifying with conditioned existence is inherently painful. So uh, I think it's very important to value Dukkha as a, as a symptom of something that needs our attention, either at the superficial physical level or the psychological level, or much more deeply at this, this existential or spiritual level. I've kind of tried to train myself to this, just to notice all the time that there's uh, some uh, uh, that, that 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 dukkha is an indication that, that my not being quite happy and so forth is an indication of something, uh, and that there's uh, uh, it's not just I can you know rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic. It's it's that there's something deeper that's uh, to be brought into play. Uh, so, yes, I think if you, if you can train yourself to track dukkha, uh, which we are, are in, by nature uninclined to do, uh, we don't want to experience dukkha, but uh, if you can train yourself to track that because it's telling you something about how you're operating. If we can train your, ourselves to that, then we're going to notice the reactions much more, more fully. But what I always say, what Chandrasheel and I always say, is don't think this is something bad. When a reaction is taking place, don't think bad me. Don't think uh, I must um, stop reacting. Because what we try then to do is be a good boy or good girl, a non-reactive uh, person uh, putting on a, a, a pleasant front. But actually, as I've said, our reactions show us where energy lies.
yes, you, you, you think, great, here is some material to work with. Here is Tarpanagpo. Here is uh, uh, something that is uh, showing me that there's energy that is not flowing and not flowing in the right direction that could be helping me in my spiritual life. So that's the first step. In a way, it's, you could sort of go from there in many different ways. You could talk about it in many different ways. Uh, you know, every time I present reaction practice, uh, I do it in a different way because it depends on the situation, the people I'm talking to. At the moment, I'm under the influence of uh, Bhante's talk uh, and Tapanagpo. So let's see where that takes us. So you reacting to somebody else uh, who's done something that sets you off and uh, you feel the, the irritation. So you, that, that's what you notice first is the kind of desire to uh, do something about it. Just say something clever to, if possible, get them out of the team or, um, uh, uh, or whatever, or to uh, make them do what they ought to do, in your view. You all know the sort of things that one thinks. Uh, and <clears throat> so you try to get back to the immediate sensation you, you, you don't try immediately to start thinking about it, although if you are to think about it, you think, oh, great, something to work with. Because here is a clue to my self-clinging. Here is a clue to the, the, the issue. And not only that, here is a clue to energy that is not flowing uh, in tune with reality. So you... Uh, you, 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 if you say anything to yourself, that's what you say. And then you drop back into trying to just experience uh, the, the feeling in the, in the literal sense, experience the feeling, not the thought about the feeling or the analysis of the feeling, but the actual sensation. Uh, where is it in your body? Uh, how does it uh, manifest? You might just notice the sort of images that come into your mind. That might be a clue to how to sink down, but you try to get inside the feeling itself uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a sense of being very mindful of it. You don't block it. Above all, you don't block it because uh, you're then blocking energy and it'll simply happen again. It'll come round again, but maybe with a bit more inhibition. So you try to sort of drop down into, into the, the, uh, the feeling and uh, sometimes that can be enough. Sometimes suddenly the energy is available to you, uh, in my experience. Some, sometimes it just sort of spontaneously resolves itself, particularly if you get good at this, if you see what I mean, and you kind of begin to learn the patterns of your own uh, reactivity. Uh, and you, you, you're, you're able just to say, oh, wait a minute, this is a valuable clue. Now, what am I feeling? Ah, and there's the energy. But you may have to work more. Uh, and um, here again, it gets a bit more difficult to be uh, at all prescriptive because this isn't really a, a practice in the sense of a formal one, two, three, four. It's a suggestion about how you might deal with uh, a, a very common dimension of our, our, of our experience in a way that really helps us to, to grow and to be more effective as individuals uh, and especially as a, as a team because you're working closely together, reactions will come. I'm sure I don't need to tell you that. I'm sure you're all very good at reacting to each other. Uh, and uh, uh, the, 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 that's part of the value of a team, that you're, you're forced is the wrong word, but you're, you're brought up against your own reactive patterns and you're not able to rest within them. That's why Bhante talks about work being the tantric guru. That's what he means, that both uh, objectively, because in work you come up against problems, and when you come up against those problems, you have to draw on deeper energies in order to meet them. But also in the sense that when you're working with others, you come into a, a raw, a, a more raw interaction 
which gets to those hidden corners that nothing else can reach, uh, that we work around. Yes, to some extent it comes up in relationships, in, in, in sexual or romantic relationships, but often nowadays we just change, change the partner because uh, get, a, get a better one who's not going to be like that. But um, yeah, it does come up in that context, but often then you can work it out so that you work around it, as it were. But in a community, in a team, uh, you can't do that because there's always somebody who you've not worked things out with yet. Um, I'm not trying to say it's all about reactivity. Of course, there's lots of other things that come up and very positive things. But one of the most powerful points in, in working together is the fact that you are coming up against things that you do not like, maybe not very strongly, or maybe very strongly, and that, that uh, spark off in you reactions of one sort or another. Famously, Bante talked about uh, communities as being like a, a pebble polishing machine. This is a well-known image, isn't it? But you know, you put pebbles in a, a raw pebbles, as it were, in a jar, and you have a, a vibrator of some sort, and they rub up against each other, and they come out all shiny and, and beautiful. That's what a team is. Uh, that's what a community is. You're coming up against each other, but what you have to do is not think uh, badly of your own reactivity. Of course, maybe you're all sorted out and it's all sweetness and light, so if I am, I'm preaching to the choir, but um, probably not, probably not. Uh, so you, you value the, the, uh, uh, the fact that something is difficult for you as an opportunity. You look down into it, you try to connect with the feeling, and uh, you, you, you can sometimes find, well, you, if you look closely, you can find uh, something deeper that requires expression. You can find within you some energy, it's the best way I can put it, that requires fuller expression. I don't think I'm going to say much more than that. I could get a bit more technical about it, as it were, but I don't feel inclined to. I feel more inclined to uh, see us have a bit of a, a, a shared exploration. What my contribution is, so to speak, with, with Chandrashil, is to uh, think of this as a valuable thing, that our reactions are valuable, and to uh, encourage us to investigate internally. I've been talking about this for some time. I think we've been talking about it for 10 or 15 years in India. And uh, I've noticed that I've talked about it a bit in the West, and it seems to have caught on a bit. And I know even around the LBC there are a few small groups of people, particularly I think Dhammacharanis, who meet uh, to discuss uh, reaction practice. And uh, they really enjoy it, uh, oddly. Uh, which shows that it's working, doesn't it? Because something that is generally considered rather rude uh, and not to be talked about uh, and as, as, as a problem becomes something valuable and uh, creative. So what you, you, you're, you're trying to reach to is the creative energy in the reaction. Something in you is unfulfilled. Of course, you can look at it in psycho, psychological terms, in terms of childhood conditioning and so forth. That's all there. But I think that can only really be used to direct you to the energy, if you see what I mean. It, otherwise, it becomes goes up into your head and you've got an explanation. It's, it's, I'm not denying the, the value of that, uh, of, of the exploration. But fundamentally, what one trying to do is, is connect with the energies that are not fulfilled, the deeper creative energies that are not fulfilled and that express themselves in that kind of reactivity. So uh, usually in India I would give a sort of a chart, but I don't feel inclined to do that anymore. I'm not sure that that's apposite. Uh, what I could say is that there is also a, an insight dimension to this, but you need to be a bit careful not to use the insight dimension to lose connection with the energy. This is one thing I'm, I'm quite cautious about the fashionable discussions of, of insight. 
because I think they go right up into the head. And uh, they, you know, sometimes one feels in people who claim to be stream entrants and even arahats, I've met an arahat or two, um, yet the one's basic feeling about them is they don't know what a feeling is. Um, um, and, uh, you know, it's, if that's an arahant, please give me a prothagena any day, a worldling any day. It's so alienated um, uh, and dissociated uh, as if uh, the, the, the pursuit of, of insight through a particular framework, which is highly cognitive, leads to a, 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 a removal from the body and from feeling. And my goodness, I uh, you was know, talking about the rootless society last night. I could say it was also a bodiless society, speaking personally. Um, uh, and uh, it, uh, our, our way of thinking about spiritual life is often so disembodied. So uh, when I talk about the insight dimension, I don't want to provoke a, a sort of, um, um, you know, a, 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 a highly intellectualized approach. But uh, in my own experience, it, it can be, this sort of practice can be a very powerful uh, um, insight, uh, can lead to a, a, an insight. But um, uh, it, it, it's not always accessible. But I'll, I'll describe an experience which for me was behind uh, this, this development. Uh, I had a lot of difficulty with another order member in India. Um, uh, a lot of difficulty. There's a tremendous tension between us and we're both quite senior. And it was very awkward and embarrassing because of course it influenced other people even though we rigorously tried not to let it. People aren't stupid. They can tell the little silence when somebody's name mentioned or the kind of walking around mentioning them, that sort of thing. So uh, it, it, it had reached a quite a big, big pitch. And I was leading an intensive retreat, a uh, meditation retreat for men. We were in full silence. And every day I was leading the six element practice. But the, my mind was just going round and round with what a beast he was. He, of course, objectively is, but that's another question. Um, uh, of course, there's something that I was reacting to, but that's not the point. So I was going round and round and round and round with, uh, uh, you know, what what I'd like to say to him, what he ought to do, what somebody else ought to do, how Bante ought to sort it out, etc. And I was leading the six element practice. So I'd be saying, and, uh, you know, uh, experience the earth element inside you, the earth element outside you. It's not me, it's not mine, not myself. That bastard. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, just sort of fighting to stay with the with the practice. At the same time, my, my mind on another level, uh, chattering away about, uh, you know, what's the word for it? Propunchizing away about him, X. And at uh, a certain point, uh, I caught myself. You know, what are you doing? All these people are listening to your exposition of the six element practice and will come up to you afterwards. Oh, I suppose that was wonderful. And I know what's really going on. I'm just struggling with kind of playground stuff. And um, uh, somehow the combination of the six element practice and that sort of reactivity, reactive propunchizing, sort of connected. And I suddenly realized that whatever it was, well, I saw very clearly what it was, I was, actually felt he was blaming me. I felt guilty, if you see what I mean. And I suddenly realized the six element practice sort of flowed into my feeling experience and it just dissolved, it just completely dissolved. I realized it was a completely conditioned process, phenomenon that I'd built up. It was something without um, Atman, without uh, Swabhava, without Sara, without uh, essence. It was just a conditioned package. And uh, I believe this it, it, at that time, it was a very genuine experience of, uh, of insight on some level or other. I'm not saying anything about how far or deep it went. But the odd thing is, it never came back. 
I'd sort of seen it. I'd seen the whole uh, structure of it, all the conditions that led up to it. Seen, not thought. I'd been become very aware of them. And they just pew, dissolved. And, uh, you know, I was fully into a, a conscious element without an observer and without an observed. So how do you do that? Well, I don't want to sort of make it into a practice, in a, again, in a formal sense, but I want to suggest it's a sort of promise of the, of the reaction practice, that if you can get down into the, into the feeling and sort of observe it, uh, not in an alienated way, alienated would mean that you stand aside from it and uh, you do not actually fully feel it. Uh, you're, you're just feeling, as it were, your thought about it. Uh, but you, you remain within it, and within it, without a thought, you see it for what it is. A, 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 a constructed, impermanent uh, um, uh, state which has no solid core to it. And it's just made out of a whole set of conditions, some of which go into my childhood, some of which perhaps go into previous lives. And when you see that, when you really see it, not think it, that's the problem, when you really see it, it just goes. Of course, there are other ones come along, but that was a big one for me, and it, it made a big difference, uh, a huge difference. I, I let go of something that had held me in a, a, um, a conflict with somebody else. I'm not saying the conflict went away, but it went more to do with real issues rather than with feelings. Um, so there is a promise, as it were, in this practice, but I think one shouldn't force that because if one forces it, I think it just goes straight up into the head, which is our great danger uh, as, a, as a culture. We're all up there, up there, and uh, uh, we need to get ourselves down in contact with ourselves. Of course, different people have different experiences and different backgrounds and so on, but certainly where I come from, it's very heady. And that's the problem with our spiritual lives, that they go up there because that's the, 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 the emphasis of the general culture although different people relate to that differently, come from different uh, angles on it. But yes, don't, please don't take this reaction practice as a, a, a way of uh, theorizing your experience. The main thing is to use it to connect with your experience, try to connect with it deeply enough to experience the energy that is in the reaction uh, and it may be that as a result of really connecting with it, you see it as it is, and it ceases to be um, something that has a sort of fixed status in, the, in reality, but becomes simply a conditioned phenomenon, which uh, uh, has arisen in dependence on conditions and can go when those conditions pass. So I hope that's reasonably clear what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is very simple. Probably most of you are doing something like that anyway, but uh, I wanted to spell it all out because I've been asked several times to explain what I mean. <laughs>